Today at the National Press Club, Niadol Nyon, lawyer, human rights advocate and the chair of Harmony Alliance, who is launching the report of the first comprehensive study of Australian migrant women. Niadol Nyon, today at the National Press Club. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club in Canberra. I'm the club's president, Laura Tingle, and this is our Westpac address. As we've just heard, we're having a, a really interesting speech today from Nardor Nguyen about uh, the report that uh, is being released today. It's a joint effort of, of the Harmony Alliance, of which she's chair, and of, uh, of, uh, of, sorry, of uh, uh, academic work as well, which is a first uh, real look at the experience of refugee and migrant women in Australia. And we could have no better person to talk us through that than our speaker today. So please welcome her. Thanks. Um, I'm just having a moment. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands in which we meet, the Nongawal people. Since we all live and work on these lands, where they practice traditions and their cultures, where they raise family, where they worship, and where they dream, I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I pay my respects to these elders who continue to maintain connections to their tradition and one of the oldest civilization on earth. I believe that to pause and to truly acknowledge First Nation people, and what was brutally and often violently taken from them is the first necessary step in reimagining what this country can be. If we are to free ourselves from the past that continue to haunt the present, as exemplified by the vast gaps, by the vast statistical gaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, whether it, is, whether it is in health, in education, and even in death in custody. I think we will have to resolve this important question of reconciliation before moving on to the, to the other important question of multiculturalism. And so, at the risk of sounding repetitive, but in the hope that my acknowledgement of country is not a mere formality, and that it serve as a reminder, a critical reminder, that it is part of our ongoing business of nation building, I repeat again my acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the lands in which you and I meet today. I acknowledge their history of resistance and I acknowledge their continual survival and I hope to look forward to Australia, a country that is truly at some point, truly reconciled with itself. On behalf of my fellow panelists, Associate Professor Maria, Wick Ma Maria Wicks, I'm sorry for getting your name wrong, I'm a bit nervous on this platform. <laughs> So indulge me a little bit. And I've been told that I need to slow down because I speak quite fast. So if I'm speaking slower than natural, that's because there's someone to blame there. I think it's Carla. <laughs> but I would like to acknowledge uh, the presence of Associate Professor Rebecca Weeks and Associate Professor Maria Seagrave. And I thank, I truly thank the National Press Club for the opportunity to stand here and launch our report, Migrant and Refugee Women, Safety and Security. This is a powerful report. It's a powerful and comprehensive study that draws on the experiences and the view of nearly 14,000 migrant and refugee women. In other words, and in simpler words, it tells you some part of our story, our lived experiences here, how we move and feel and live in this country that is now our country too. Some of the stories, some of our stories, might have begun far from here, but like I said, we now think this is home. And I remember, for me, when Australia first felt like home, I had landed at Melbourne Telemarine Airport with an Australian passport in hand. And I handed that passport to the immigration uh, officer, and she inspected it and returned to me and said, welcome home. Welcome home. These were the words that marked for me the search or the end of a search of a physical home but the beginning of a sense of an emerging identity. I was born and raised in refugee camps, which is why it is ter terrifying to stand here, because nothing in my early circumstances 
would suggest that I'll be here. And war robbed my family of a home in a physical sense, but it did more. On our humanitarian entry visa to Australia, in the place requiring the listing of a name was the word stateless. War had ruthlessly stripped us of the confidence and the hope and the courage to build our lives because we had nowhere, literally no foundation to build them. We lived on fortnightly Russian foods that were, was given to us by the United Nations, which is really to say that we live at the mercy and the charity of others. But we also lived waiting for grace, for the favor of a country willing to take us. At the time, my mother had applied for resettlement to Australia, and as we waited to hear from the Australian immigration officer, officers, who were taking too long for my mother's liking, so she started praying and praising God, hoping that he would get the immigration officers to hurry up and get us our application. But when mom stopped singing, I took over, but I always waited. I think the little lawyer in me knew strategically this would work. I waited until she had finished singing and praying because believing she was of a deeper faith, I thought God would be in a better mood and would be easily persuaded as I take over. <laughs> so when all was quiet, I began these negotiations and I pleaded and I promised, with, I promised God that if my family made it of that refugee camp and into Australia, I was going to get a university education, I would always be a good Christian, I would always be grateful, and I would never complain, and would always, always listen to my mother. As you can see, I was desperate. <laughs> I was in my final year of high school, and I knew if I didn't get out of this, that refugee camp by the end of it, it would be the end of many journeys but certainly the end of my education journey. And I, I was lucky, I was very, very lucky. I did make it to Australia. I did attend university. However, I have caught myself complaining when trams in Melbourne run two to three minutes late. So I can't say I kept all my promises. And I think it was always ridiculously ambitious for a teenager to claim that they would always, always listen to their mother. And it was only after reaching this country that I finally felt a sense of security and safety and optimism that my future would be great. And sadly, that optimism is not something that we can say many of the women today in our surveys report. As chair of, of Hami Alliance, I am very pleased to launch our report. And I repeat, migrant and refugee women, safety and security. This report was written in partnership with the Immigration and Inclusion Center and the, Gen and the Gender and Family Violence Prevention Center at Monash University. It is the first national study uh, that looks and examines the experiences and the range of threats that migrants and women uh, face. Today I only have time to talk very briefly about it because my two panelists, whom I hope you would ask questions, will take us through in more details. But I really hope, and I sincerely hope, that all policymakers in this room you know, have some light night reading and fully read this report and try to think about some policy changes. Some of the findings in this report echoes the experiences of Australian-born women, but others speak to the unique experiences of refugee and migrant women. Although even in that cohort, there are still differences, intergenerational differences between the women as with all women across this country, domestic violence remains an important and pressing issue for migrant and refugee women. The scope of suffering is enormous. A third of the women survey reported having experienced some form of domestic or family violence. This report also shows that women on temporary visas face some specific risk. Temporary visas holders consistently report high proportion levels of domestic violence including general behavior, including controlling behavior generally, but also controlling behavior related to their migration status. And this includes threats from husbands and partners of deportation, and sometimes threats to be separated from their own children, some who may be Australian citizens. 
We think this is a really, really important finding, since to address it, it will require policymakers to move beyond the fragmented support afforded to women on temporary visas and look at structural reforms that truly prioritize the safety of any woman, regardless, regardless of their visa status. Another important finding is that nearly 40% of the women who experienced crimes that were not related to domestic violence or family violence believe that the most recent assault or other crimes that they experienced was motivated by bias or prejudice. And that suggests we still have some work to do on the issue of racism and discrimination. Finally, one striking trend across the survey is the generational differences in relation to trust in institutions. In terms, again, of crimes that are not related to family violence, our study shows that younger women under the age of 30 experience more generalized victimization, yet they were unlikely, or they were, they were less likely than older women to see police as legitimate and trustworthy, and more likely to see them as procedurally unjust. Significantly also in the context of intergenerational difference is that not only do these young women lack trust in so-called mainstream organizations, they also lack trust in those organizations that people would assume because of the way they look they should trust. For example, nearly a third of our participants under the age of 44 reported no trust, no trust in religious institutions. Again, we think this is a really important finding. Firstly, because mainstream organizations rely on religious leaders when dealing with migrant community, and the data here reveals that perhaps we should revisit that assumption that it always work. Second, it suggests that there's a far more complex story around the sense of belonging and how young people often have to deal with the dilemma of belonging and not belonging at the same time. The dilemma of finding a sense of home while often feeling rejected isolated by the same places they wish to claim his home. And for me, this is also powerful because in some way, I can trace my own story in it. Our life changed radically when we came to Australia. Within a decade, we'd moved from being stateless refugees to enjoying the privileges and the protections of being Australian citizens. I had moved from sitting in an overcrowded, overheated classroom to graduating from Melbourne University with a law degree. And in 2016, I achieved a long-held dream forged in the dusty grounds of Kakuma when I was admitted into the legal profession as an Australian lawyer. And I am now standing here, standing on a platform that in so many ways, it seems slightly ridiculous that a young girl in Kakuma running around could be addressing the National Press Club. So this is home in the way it has embraced me, but it has also rejected me. Members of my families have been subjected to racist abuse and attacks, have seen some of them avoid Hall Street just to avoid harassment. I remember my mom sitting on the floor of the living room, surrounded by her shopping bags, casually mentioning to me she had just been called a black dog. And her tone was that of someone who has given up all hope of being treated with dignity. And so, as if to sustain herself, she had to see the word black dog as something as normal and as simple as good morning. I recall being called the N-word while just walking down a Melbourne street, an abuse that, among other things, interrupts the sense that you're just another person enjoying the beautiful Melbourne summer weather. Again, a police officer, a serving police officer wrote to me on Facebook and called me an ignorant C who should F off back to the war toward S whole country I came from. I know that sounds like a rap number. <laughs> so I'm gonna let the rest of you decode it. But I, I also recall the first time I, had, I looked over my shoulder after speaking at a rally against racism. I was checking to see whether I was being followed. After reading violent abuse directed at me online, I could no longer take my security for granted. Since then, I have never felt fully safe 
in that innocent way I felt when I first landed in Australia from Kakuma refugee camp. But this is still home in its rejection as well in the many ways that it's embraced me. The truth is, I am afraid to even mention this incident because many people expect that because of what Australia has given me, I should simply be grateful. Discussions about race or racism are seen as biting the hand that fed you. But to me, these attitudes reveal and reflect the enduring conditional acceptance of immigrants and the conditional status of our citizenship. Because while criticism of Australia by other citizens is seen as part of the standard political discourse, or even welcome as an indication of their desire to improve their country, criticism by people like me, people who look like me, is seen as a sign of our potential disloyalty. We should go back to where we came from if we don't like Australia as it is. In this way, we are conditioned to expect less and by extension to, to demand less than the full privileges of our citizenship and the enjoyments of belonging. I have never fully accepted this dichotomy of belonging imposed on immigrants. By coming to a new country, you change, as I have, and you learn to love that country as I have, but you also struggle with the love for that country and your place in that country in the face of racism and discrimination, as I have. The good, the bad, the embraces and the rejections are all part of the becoming, of becoming Australian. It is messy, it is joyful, it is confusing, it is frustrating, but it does not lend itself to myths, whether it is the myth of a singular experience of being Australian or that more grand and fancy identified by Paul Keating in his speech in 1966, the myth of the monoculture and the lie that we can retreat to. So as we look forward, I think we will be better served as a country if our search for identity recognize the dilemma of balancing senses of belonging and home. And that brings me to the concept of multiculturalism, a fundamental organizing principle in the search for our identity as a diverse nation. In 1966, Australia introduced the first visa for non-Europeans, and through that change, it began to dismantle the old underpinning of the Australian settlement since Federation, the White Australia policy. In 1973, the Whitlam government formally abandoned the White Australian policy, and that year, Immigration Minister Al Gaspi made the first major speech endorsing Australia embrace of what he calls the multicultural society. It was a radical term at the time. In 1978, Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser had embedded in Australia's policy a definition of multiculturalism based on social cohesion, equality of opportunity, and the right to maintain one cultural identity. The Fraser government understood that new services for immigrants, including settlement programs for refugee, English language classes, migrant resource centers, and the establishment of an ethnic radio television were essential to giving practical support and form to this new way of thinking. Finally and critically, and I wonder whether it's something that would occur today, Malcolm Fraser stared down a certain degree of public opposition in order to bring to Australia more than 70,000 into Chinese refugees, Australia's first significant nationwide immigration since Federation. So looking back, we can see that it was a remarkable decade or so of policy making initiated by both main political party and one that will lay the foundation of contemporary Australia. Multiculturalism was a bold and even revolutionary social concept. For the first time, we began to see difference as a strength instead of seeking comfort only in being part of the British Empire. Our embrace of difference influenced Australia's trajectory toward liberalization and reform because it was our multicultural society 
that set us up to maximize our trading position in an era of globalization. Our links to every corner of the world gave us access to every market. It bolsters trade and investment, and our multicultural brand, I think, allow us to punch above our weight. It has also enabled our politicians to boast, as they often do, that we live in the most successful multicultural, multicultural society in the world. I wonder if they have New Zealand's or Canadian friends, because if they did, they will be constantly engaged in an argument about which country is the most successful multicultural society in the world. Arguably, I think we became a successful multicultural society because multiculturalism, or our unique Australian version of it, was a deliberate and considered attempt to build on, an, on, on Australia Anglitarian idea by creating what I term in this speech a new grand bargain. What was this, ba what was this bargain? I, I think it was that we would invite immigrants, women, and minority to share in the wealth and security of the nation that until then was mostly preserved for Anglo-Saxons, white males. It was that we would expand the embrace of what we believe to be our Anglitarian character from its original center. But Australian multiculturalism was developed at a time before open borders, before rapid global currency movement, before mass travel, before deregulation of the labor market, the financial system, and mass offshore production. It was developed before casualization and relentless global economic competition. It was built on a foundation that in my view is now profoundly shaken by the forces of globalization, technology, shifting centers of global power, and the rise of China. Our multiculturalism was not designed for this time, for this radical uncertainty that globalization has brought. At the time of the Galbally report, only 13% of Australian workers, workers were in casual or insecure work, and nearly 70% of people were able to own their home before the age of 35. I think we can all admit that things have changed. Globalization had made, has made us more, prosper, more prosperous and more educated and more worldly. But it has not been evenly distributed to all. In many ways, the end result of globalization collapsed what I early call the Australian center, the center in which we were inviting immigrants and women to come and be a part of. And because of that, it has hollowed out not only the vision of multiculturalism, that was embraced by former governments. It has also undermined the very idea and promise of being Australian. Because now roughly 25% of all employees are casual workers. There's a growing class of working poor that include many new immigrants caught in the gig economy and all that entails, where there's a lack of workplace safety net, no annual leave or sick leave, and where for some temporary migrants, no access to Medicare or Centrelink or even job seekers. There is a tremendous growth in multi-generational and entrenched long-term unemployment and in community of severe disadvantage. A granted, report institute, uh, a granted Institute report released in 2019 warned that young Australians are now in danger of being the first generation in memory to have lower living standard than their parents' generation. Understanding this issue, to me, I think is important. At the very least, it might enable us to form a kinder view of individuals who feel left out and left behind, to appreciate the sense of loss of those who previously stood at the center of Australian society, but now see themselves or think to see themselves they've been pushed to the fringes. We can understand the fear that they may feel to not see a better future for their children. We can understand that the prejudice some of them feel is a manifestation of insecurity and uncertainty. We can understand that fear because maybe for some of us, it's a fear that we've had, a fear that we will not be able to look after our family or ourselves. that fear that we will not have a dignified future. I know that fear that kind of fear that leaves you without hope. I saw it in my own mother 
when she was so desperate to take us out of that camp that she was willing to leave all she knew behind. She left her culture, she left her language, she left her status, she left her own identity. Now, I'm not saying this, and I'm not saying this at all to excuse prejudice and hatred. And I can't say that, because I know through personal experiences the heavy price that racism exert. To experience racism is not merely about being offended, as some would say. In the words of the African-American writer, Tenehisi Cortez, to suffer racism is a visceral experience. It dislodges brains, it blocks hair waves, it rips muscle, it extracts organ, it cracks bones, it breaks teeth, and it brutally extinguishes lives, as we saw when a, New Z when a white Australian white supremacy supremacists kill 51 Muslim in a place of worship in New Zealand. In Australia and across the globe, we have seen how difference is now emerging as a target for fear and hate. Asia recently testified that 40% of credible threats of violence are now from far-right extremists. It is no secret that many in these groups see immigration and people like me as the problem and they see multiculturalism as a burden, not a remedy. Sadly, some Australian politicians have been willing to support or at least dog whistle this narrative. Instead of seeking to mold a new consensus, they have sought to exploit the fears and prejudice of people that have been made vulnerable by the impacts of globalizations and other factors. Maintaining and building a multicultural consensus in a new era of uncertainty requires extraordinary and renewed commitment by our leaders. To return to Tennessee Cortez again, we need leaders who are conscious citizens of this terrible and beautiful world. Leaders who understand the terrible parts but do not excuse it, let alone exploit it, exploit it. and who seek to nourish what can be beautiful about us. We need the kind of leadership that gave birth to multicultural Australia. The creators of multiculturalism had a far-sighted vision of this country, and they sought to celebrate and reconcile our differences instead of exploiting them. And I believe their vision served as well, even now as I make remarks with the benefit of hindsight about how I think we should improve it. If multiculturalism is to come of age, it needs to move from being a rhetorical device to having institutional expression in our nation's life. For even though we claim to be the most successful multicultural society in the world, we remain in our democratic institutions and in our most important representation of what passes for national identity as monoculture. I want to mention two issues with the current model of multiculturalism. The first is the presumption of who holds power that was embedded in its original structure. The second is the way in which the model shapes the accompanying attitudes of insisting on gratitudes of immigrants instead of affording them the full entitlement of their rights to citizenship and belonging. On the nature of power, the leaders who gave us the current model of multiculturalism emerged from, benefited from, and came to lead a society that was still patriarchal in its governing assumptions and Anglo-Saxons in its institutions and philosophies. Australia multiculturalism today is still confined within the power structures in which it was forged. It still remains as one group inviting another, often less powerful, to participate in the nation's life. It is not a relationship of equals or of a common endeavor, and our institutions mirror these power, power differences. Professor Kim Rubenstein's works provide a practical example of my argument here. Using this nation founding document, the Constitution as inherited at Federation and as it stands today, she identified a lack of harmony between Australia's Constitution and its people, 
and she asserts that a constitution, that the constitution as it currently stands does not reflect the, fundam the fundamental changes of Australian relationship to the Queen or with multicultural Australia and has never represented its connection with Indigenous Australians. In a soon to be published article, she states, in a liberal democratic society like Australia, bound by the rule of law, where those with institutional power, such as the parliament, the executives, and the courts are subject to the law, it is fundamental that the foundation to those rules as set out in the constitution are connected to and mirror the experience of those bound by them. Now, I think that is a bold reimagination of Australia and what it can be. If we are to pursue that reimagination re further, we might find it no longer acceptable that nearly 20% of our population come from non-European background, but only make 4% of our federal politicians. Another problem with the power structures that don't reflect the population is that they not only shape and limit our thinking, they shape our attitudes towards each other. The prevailing attitude that Australian citizenship is a gift bestowed on immigrants, while it's treated for some as an inheritance, and for which these immigrants should be profoundly and forever grateful, acts to qualify and even contradicts migrant full sense of Australian citizenship and belonging. As an immigrant, an immigrant who is now a citizen, I can assure you I am grateful. But gratefulness is not a basis on which you can build an equal society based on mutual respect. Such an attitude suggests that there are two kinds of Australians, those who came here earlier and those who came here later, and that the first group builds the place and the second came along and reap the benefits. I don't think I need to be an immigrant because I think most of Australians know that migrants have enriched Australia. They have strengthened its economy, its society, and its place in the world in ways that will remain forever beyond measure. I think the recent India ban is a, is a practical example of the danger of not affording a class of citizens the value of their full citizenship rights and treating, and treating their citizenship as if it's an entitlement that can be revoked. If our parliament was truly representative, if we afforded migrant citizens the full value of their citizenship, would the response have been different? Would it have been more nuanced, more reflective of a changing, diverse, and complex society? See, I don't know that I have any straightforward or need answers. But I speak about these things because I feel in some way I must. These are not intellectual musings. They're personal. They're issues. These issues that I'm talking about have significant impacts on the life of the women in these surveys. But it's also personal because they would have an impact on the kind of country my children will become a part. I am comforted by the fact that even though it appears hard, this country has made brave and far-sighted decisions before. We abandoned the white Australian policy. In 1967, Australia voted in a referendum to change the constitution so that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people would be counted as part of the population. We are being asked to do it now in the form of listening to the Uluru statement from the heart and in creating an indigenous voice to parliament enshrined in the constitution. And now, under the pressures of globalization and growing inequality of opportunity, we are asked to revisit what we offer each other as citizens and to rethink the role of multiculturalism, the role of multiculturalism in our nation's future. Multiculturalism is a grand and revolutionary concept, but I think its purpose is really simple. It is to live with each other without the fear of each other. This means a country where we have a common bond and where racism is not tolerated, where women feel safe on the street and in parliament, where they feel safe in their homes, 
a country where a visa status is not a tool for coercive control. What this country decides now, especially in the face of all these challenges, will become the legacy and the inheritance of future generations. It will be what we decided to become this moment now. It will be my children's home too. And I know I sound a little bit aspirational. And maybe, as my reading suggests, there is little appetite or tradition in Australia for grand statements. But I stand here as a young refugee who once had big and impossible dream, and who arrived here with no money, and who's the generosity of a, this nation when they were willing to, and a vision of multiculturalism created before she was born made many of our impossible dream seem real today. So I did a bit of inspirational thinking because I want us to reimagine this country. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Nodal, and it's so great to hear somebody actually having grand ambitions. We, we, we certainly don't get a, a lot of them uh, here at the National Press Club. Um, <laughs> if, if I could just start by asking you, um, I'm fascinated by that thought about how you uh, reimagine multiculturalism um, in, in this new era, and particularly about how how you capture it in the Constitution? Mm. I, think it's, I think Professor Robert's science work um, is really interesting in, in some of the way it suggests what aspect of the constitutions can be amended. And I know there's a lot of con conversation about constitutional amendment now, and I do not want to shift from the Uluru statement mm. focus. But I think that really if multiculturalism is going to come of age and it's not going to be just something that we use rhetorically, then it has to be reflected in our nation's um, institutions, in our courts, in our politics, and it's currently not the case. So um, I think the dual uh, citizenship provision, for example, is an interesting practical start to think about what an amendment to that session would suggest. Because um, we now live in a very diverse, a very, very diverse um, country um, where people still have family members and connection to other, to other countries. Um, and so there's a question on whether we should be revisiting um, the usefulness of such a provision in modern Australia. So maybe that's a practical place to start. Um, well, I'll bring in our panellists uh, at this stage. Um, Rebecca Wicks is an Associate professor, professor and Director for the Monash Migration and Inclusion Centre at the School of Social Sciences at Monash University. Um, which is one of the reasons I had a senior moment and sort of thought, how do I introduce, how do I introduce this earlier on? Because they're very long titles. A lot of syllables. And um, Marie Seagrave is an Associate Professor and Deputy Director of the Monash Migration and Inclusion Centre and a key researcher with the Monash Gender and Family Violence Prevention Centre at Monash University. Um, so I suppose that brings us to the re release of this report, which uh, really is um, pretty groundbreaking. Um, some of the things that Nardo was saying about the experience of uh, migrant and refugee women uh, and the controlling behaviour was interesting. And um, I was wondering whether uh, one of you could talk about that and also uh, this point about, um, about the, the status of women and the specific risks they, they face uh, and the fact that they... There's now this um, really interesting and complex story about uh, how they aren't belonging anywhere. And, um, and, and I, I was really interested that young women in particular have such a mistrust of institutions. So, I might start with the first question. Um, the report's significant because we're having a national conversation at the moment around the ne next national plan, around how we think about women's experiences of gendered violence broadly. And it's critical that we have that conversation as a nation and recognise that women across Australia from very diverse backgrounds experience domestic and family violence at very high rates and that we continue to see this growing and we're not making any significant impact. 
But the report is important because it documents migrant and refugee women's experiences. And in relation to temporary visa holders in particular, we already knew from previous studies I've been involved in that temporary visa holders experience specific forms of controlling behaviour which is related to their migration status. And this is really important for us to understand. And so the report for the first time asked about controlling behaviours broadly that women across Australia experience, but also very specific questions around the use of migration status as a way of leveraging control. And what we found is that temporary visa holders experience this at a higher rate. And it's critical for us to understand that at a time when our response tends to be very piecemeal and not understanding that the migration system is a part of domestic and family violence, that it's providing leverage for perpetrators who are often male partners or former partners, but also family members and in-law family members. And I think in the context of Niadol's presentation, it's critical for us to think about systems and the way that that contributes to domestic and family violence, rather than focusing on very short-term responses to try to band-aid over the situation. So that's really critical. I'll let Rebecca address the other question. Thanks, Marie. Um, we were really surprised when we saw the age difference. It wasn't something that we were expecting going into, um, into the field with this report. And I've reflected a lot on that age difference, trying to understand why that might be. Because it's not just age, it's also people who speak English well and people who are educated, who participated in our survey. Um, and when I think about that, in, in some ways, maybe this is... A, this is a positive thing. Maybe this is a sign of empowerment. Maybe this is um, women who are like Niadol, who are understanding the limits of the system, who are understanding where the barriers are. And, and they're not happy with that. And rather than being a grateful migrant, perhaps they're starting to move towards a position where they want more, where they, wait, they want that full, that full suite of citizenship um, rewards that come with being an Australian. So, I'm not sure it's something we have to be worried about, but I think it's, it's really quite an interesting finding and, and one from my experience speaking with, with migrant women and younger migrant women and working with amazing younger migrant women. They aren't prepared to be grateful for their citizenship. Um, they're a citizen and, and they should have the same rights, responsibilities and obligations and benefits as others in the country. So I, I, I'm sort of seeing that as something exciting and something to watch for the future in the hopes that we see more migrant young women speaking up and being powerful and demanding their place in society. So yeah, we'll, we'll watch that space, but that's my, that's my feel on that. Well, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't think it was surprising, but maybe because, um, uh, maybe because it's, it's an experience that I've had conversations with other young women about um, the idea of, of having perceptions, uh, even in your own community, of belonging to one or the other, but not necessarily feeling as if you, you belong in those communities entirely. Because I think we are shaped and changed by the act of immigrating to this country, going to school, making friends that are from diverse background, but we are also still influenced by our own home and our own community, and it's a dance between those two yeah. constantly. So it didn't surprise me that there was um, that there was experiences of, of distrusting institutions and actually both institutions within your separate communities. It seems to make sense um, in that dilemma of trying to find a place to truly belong. Um, well, if I could just ask one other question of whoever wants to answer it. Um, the, the, how do you actually address uh, that sort of central point that you've made about the fact that uh, different visas uh, sort of protect, protect perpetrators? If you want to put women's safety uh, right up the list of, uh, of ways you design the visa system, what, what are the practical steps you could take on that? Well, in relation to temporary visa holders, it would be putting women's safety first, and that would be making it immediately available for people who are experiencing domestic and family violence to remain in the country and have the security of that, not in short promises of three months, six months, but 
but say to women, we will look after you and support you if you're experiencing this. At the moment, you have to jump through many hoops. There are very few women who can access the safety net in the form of the family violence provision. And women who come on student visas or tourist visas, uh, women whose um, partners are des denied sponsorship, we don't do anything about their experiences of abuse. We essentially say you should perhaps just not be with this person. But if you have children or you're already in an abusive relationship, we know across the country we hear the story again and again that leaving is a critically dangerous time for all women and the situation for temporary visa holders, not just temporary visa holders, but particularly that group, is very precarious. And it's very clear that there is the potential for women and women do make this decision to stay because of the fear of what will happen. It's not just fear in relation to their relationship, what will happen to them, but what are going to be the ongoing consequences for themselves, for their, for their family. So we really need to put that first. Um, well, I'll throw the questions to the floor. And the first one is from Kushani Danji from SBS. Hi, Kushani Danji from SBS. Thank you so much for your address. I'd just like to ask, in the government's most recent budget, they announced a new measure that would effectively prevent new migrants for four years from gaining access to a lot of those social services um, that other Australians are able to access. What do you make of that? And does that encourage that this line of thinking that to come to Australia you have to earn a sense of um, you have to earn your right to be able to gain access to services I think this is interesting because it's happening um, with a parallel conversation now about Australia future economy, economy recovery being um, being needing to be supported by immigration mm -hmm. And you wonder whether there is, uh, whether we are creating an environment for migrants to want to come here. Um, during the COVID-19 uh, um, outbreak, some of the supportive measures did not even provide supports for international students, which is one of the biggest part of our economy in terms of the sustaining our economy. And you've got, um, you know, long terms wait now to get your PR. We're making it harder and harder. For, for, for migrants to come here. But we're willing to take their tax, you know, and their labor, but, but not afford them the protections of, 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 of being a citizen. So I, I, I think it's, it's a disjunction between um, government priorities, recognizing that we're going to need immigration, but also creating an environment in which it seems most immigrants would not necessarily want to come because it's not necessarily as welcoming as, as it could be. David Crow. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, everybody, for your remarks. Uh, David Crow from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Uh, I know that in the report that's being released today, um, it also makes findings about economic security um, uh, and employment, um, and that's got to be connected to domestic violence as well, family violence. Um, what do you think that means? Perhaps I can ask you all, you know, I'm quite open to anybody buying in on this subject, but we know that the government's working on the next national plan on family and domestic violence that's doing so in an era with a pandemic, with a lot of economic insecurity and employment insecurity. Um, what do you think the findings today show about whether there are specific um, problems in the migrant community for migrant women and what that means for that national plan that's coming up over the next uh, weeks and months? I think in relation to the national plan, it's important that our conversation is not narrowly focused. So having gender responsive budgets is critical to the bigger picture. We need to be thinking about women's economic security at the same time we're thinking about women's safety. Those two, as you say, are absolutely inherently interconnected. So um, that's, that's fundamental. Uh, it's really important as we move towards the next, the next national plan that we think about the way that systems operate to sustain and reproduce insecurity. This can be the way that we manage um, financial benefits, creating and maintaining women's insecurity, making it very difficult to raise children whilst also um, uh, having to have obligations around looking for work and those sorts of things. We need 
to see those things across the board rather than having very discreet efforts of focusing on domestic and family violence as if it's removed from all of those other pressures that women are experiencing. So for me, that's one of the most important things that we're not saying that women's safety sits here and financial and economic security sits over here. And the other important conversation in that is that women's financial security is of benefit to the whole nation. It's not just about benefiting women, it's about improving the situation for everybody, for our children. So it has to be that kind of long-term long -term vision. Absolutely. Nick Stewart. Thank you very much. I loved your initial story about how you interceded with the uh, uh, immigration official to, uh, to attempt to uh, come here. I was wondering if you'd be prepared to in intercede with my editor, uh, <laughs> because I, I need a similar sort of help. Uh, the, the other thing is, in Australia, we have a number of um, myths, I suppose. For example, like the Anzac myth, and that's very much, they're oriented around a, a world that is no longer reflective of modern Australia. For example, there, there are very uh, far under half Australian families at the moment can trace their lineage to people who fought or in World War I. I was wondering, are you concerned that these myths and the way in which we privilege them are actually risking dividing our nation rather than bringing us all together. Are there any ideas that you think need to be not necessarily combated, but we need to reinforce different ways of thinking about particular ideals? Yeah. I'll ask my mother to pray for you, as I said, she's of a... <laughs> She's of a much deeper faith than I am, and I, I now consider myself, I was going to say a closest atheist, but if you're saying it on TV, it's now open in the, in the <laughs> um, But, but it's, it's a good question because I, I do think there's, there's a place for myth in our nation. Um, but I think your question reveal what can become the problem is how we use them and how we prioritize them. So why is it that we, you know, and I'm not necessarily criticizing, why is it that we uplift um, Anzac Day or Australian Day as the most signifying elements of our national identity, but we neglect the history of indigenous people? And I think those are the questions we need to ask ourselves, is how do we create a larger set of myths? Because I think myths are important. They make us feel connected. They make us feel um, that we have a, a history that is just not backward looking but also forward looking. They keep us anchored to a certain degree. And and I have no problem attending, you know, a, a dawn service because I think to become part of a country is to embrace some of its myth. And the question is is how do I relate to those myths if they're defined in a divisive way? If they are meant to say, so this is where you stand and this is where we belong. Um, and a good way of maybe um, giving a practical example of that is the way Australian flag has been utilised. Now that's supposed to be uh, to to be sort of a national symbol, but there's no argument that this 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 flag now has been utilised by some group as a clear sign of saying, you know, you flew here, we were born here. And I think the way we use the myth is the problems sometimes, not the myth themselves, because it's the interpretation that we bring to those myths that defines how they influence our attitudes and reflect on our communities. If, if, did, did either of you want to say something about that? Um, I, I, just, I completely agree. I think that the stories about Australia are, are wonderful, but when we're narrowing into very exclusive stories, we're forgetting about all of the other stories that coexist. And unfortunately, this is becoming politicized. These stories are deeply politicized. And in a study I did a couple of years ago on social exclusion, exclusion in, in Melbourne neighborhoods, overwhelmingly, people who were orienting to more conservative political ideas um, held really negative attitudes towards migrants. And it was one of the strongest predictors we had in, in some of the analytic models that we ran. And it was you know, it was deeply concerning because it allows for, I guess, these politicizations of myths 
which prevent then, I think, people from across the political spectrum from embracing the various stories, um, the good, bad, and the ugly stories that sort of sit across a very diverse landscape. So, yeah, I, I love a myth or two, but I would, I would certainly like to have a, a much richer representation of those stories so that people can see themselves in them. It, it, in some ways, you, you could turn it on its head and say what we actually need is some other myths um, yeah. that, that, that reflect uh, refugee stories, that reflect migrant stories. I mean, they're all pretty naff at the moment, and, which, and they basically go back to the, you know, the cuisine's improved, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but there's not... And that sort of brings us to the sort of issue of culture and of people being seen in, in all their diversity as contributors mm -hmm. uh, rather than as people who should be grateful, as, mm -hmm. as you say, no, Adolf. So. Um, Simon Gross. Uh, Simon Gross, Canberra IQ. Um, the problem of men. You've talked about um, domestic violence, coercive behaviour. I, I want to uh, raise the... I figure the... Like another uh, source of worry and grief for migrant women is their sons and, and brothers. Uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, Indo-Chinese, you, you said, uh, uh, wave of refugees, um, uh, Vietnam, basically. I remember as part of maybe two, for two decades, uh, we had Tong gangs. Mm. Um, Vietnamese boys, angry Vietnamese boys fighting each other, fighting gangs from other ethnic groups. And uh, um, uh, boys get, get bullied at school, get a hard time, and uh, um, they don't cope very well. So they get angry and they do bad things. Um, is this a real problem? Is there any variation across ethnic groups, religious groups, in terms of the numbers, uh, the size of communities? And is there uh, enough being done about it? Hmm. Um, this reminds me a little bit about the African gang pandemic mm -hmm. in, um, in Victoria, that I'm not sure what happened to that pandemic since <laughs> then. Um, but, but, but perhaps it might occur in the next election cycle. Um, <laughs> but there have been some boys get in trouble. No, I'm, I'm not denying at all that there are um, young people of African heritage that have engaged in criminal behavior. I think the question is what conclusions do we arrive, uh, derive from that? And I don't agree with the conclusion that I derive from that. Because if you have 1% of people committing um, criminal offending and you have 99% of people you know, doing their best, the idea that you select the 1% and decide to color the rest of the group I, I think is, is, is problematic. I also think that um, when we began to say ethnic groups and ethnic gangs, what we miss are the other, uh, I think the other issues that influence offending in young people generally. And those issues are similar across the board. You know, their uh, access to education, employment, socioeconomic backgrounds. These issues, if you look at the trend, don't change for any class of, of groups. Um, but I think sometimes it's useful to use the idea of race and ethnicity because it falls into lines of how um, we can build an us and them um, argument. It's their problem, it's their communities, it's their cultures. It has nothing to do with, with us. It has nothing to do with structural problems. I mean, I've, I've been a refugee and I'm not going to sit here and, and try and justify the idea of someone invading your home as excusable. It will never be excusable. Um, it's a terrifying experience, and nobody should have to go through that. But you know, uh, racializing the conversation in the way it was done in Melbourne doesn't also solve the issues, and it's um, it actually it ends up being tremendously damaging. Because one of the things that happened at the time um, was uh, I, I met a young girl, that uh, very confident young girl, um, who was uh, trying to be a lawyer. Um, and uh, the years that I've met this girl, she had a sense of confidence. She could walk in a room and you sit with her and you saw that this was a kid that wanted to go somewhere. And I can assure you that kind of media coverage broke her down. You know, I remember when she called me to go and have a lunch with her, she looked tremendously defeated. And she said she didn't want to even sit in a train and look at other people in the face. So we have to be careful about how we talk about this. Yes, we can admit 
that they are criminal offending. But I think we should try and avoid as much as we can to identify it as an ethnic problem and try and dismiss the other contributing factors in the, in, in the mix. Can I just add to that? Please. I, I think that what Niada say, was saying is just so spot on. And as a criminologist, as someone who's examined this and spoke out at the time of the African Games, you're, you're, the probability of being offended by a young male, it would be your probability is higher for someone who's actually white. So any kind of conversation, just in terms of the numbers, when we look at the numbers of the people who are offending, and so any conversation around ethnic gangs, I, I completely agree. One, one is numerically false, and and two, I think all it does is continue this sort of racialized. Um, pigeonholing of, of young men and, and I think if we really want to do something about young men offending we need to be we mean we need to be thinking about those very those very system aspects that Nero was saying around education and employment and, and that actually will will work to reduce offending in all young men. And that should be our goal. Thank you. Steve Lewis. Thank you. Um, Ms. Newman, could I ask you a question about you mentioned during your speech, I think you said about 4% federal parliament um, uh, representatives of uh, migrants and, and uh, how do we address that? Is it, is it time for the federal parliament to deal with uh, this matter perhaps by introducing some sort of quota system or the political parties? I mean, the Labor Party's been very successful in achieving around about 50% female representation in the federal parliament through uh, mm. affirmative action. Is it time for a similar sort of process? And do you think if you had a parliament that better reflected multicultural Australia, we wouldn't have the ASIO spending 40% of its time dealing with the rise of white supremacists, as you mentioned again in your speech? Yeah, I, I have to come out and say I support quotas, and I support quotas specifically in, in the context of politics because I don't think there's particularly any objective measures of merit when you are competing politically. I think it's, I think, and I'm, I'm, and I, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm not saying that to sort of uh, say that the current bunch of politicians are, you know, are not up to, um, are not up to measure. I'm going to let, I think, Donald Horn settle that. Uh, but but I think I, I do think that it's important that we we have uh, we have court, quotas in place. Um, I think it might be an easier argument to make when it comes to to gender um, because we've made some far more progress in that space, even though there's resistance. Um, but I'm not sure whether we are comfortable enough as a country to think about quotas when it comes to ethnic diversity. Um, I think it's going to be a very hard public debate to mount, especially in the current. Um, in the current cultural war context. Um, and, and I can see how negatively it might be deduced to the idea of positive discrimination and the likes. But generally, I support, um, I support quotas, particularly in the context of, 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 of politics. Because here, it's about who you know. It's about you know, maybe being in a safe seat. It's, it's all these other metrics that will really never lend themselves to an objective this, you know, measure that someone else can sort of replicate and get through. So, I um, do I think that if if the if the diversity of our parliament changed, things would change absolutely. Um, let's let's take the Indian ban for example. You have uh, many Indian citizens who couldn't were either stuck in India or here who you know had family members that have passed away or died and they couldn't you know they couldn't even go and see them do we really think if there was far more diversity in our parliament it would have taken it, i think it would have taken much more deliberation to get to the point of just saying you know stop it here uh, so i think it really impacts the kind of priorities that our government have it impacts the it impacts even some of the little things that happens in parliament you know there there is this uh, there was an incident where one of the politicians tried to pass the white supremacy slogan as, as a motion. And I'm just thinking if there were a much more diverse group, perhaps someone would have thought, hey, I've experienced this online. This is a white supremacy slogan. So it, it, it's in so many ways that you can see how that can interrupt the process in a positive way. Well, I'll take um, presidential discussion and uh, ask one last question of all of you, which is, uh, goes back to the report and uh, also to your comments, Nido, about casualisation of the workforce mm. and how much of the link into domestic violence and the experience of women is the fact that in addition to uh, visa issues and things like that, they are 
basically being marginalised in the workforce and that that leaves them sort of much more vulnerable than a, a lot of other Australians. The report in our survey doesn't allow us to make the link between casualisation really and domestic and family violence and I think the thing we would say about domestic and family violence generally is that it impacts people across all levels of the community and I, I think um, it impacts women who are in um, what would seem very well off financial positions and those on the opposite end of the spectrum. I think where it's most important for us to pay attention is to understand the various pressures and the various things that people are weighing up. But it's not as simple as suggesting that if you are at the lower end of the economic spectrum that things are more difficult in the context of domestic and family violence, but they are compounded by systems that make it more difficult. Um, if you're experiencing poverty, um, everything is compounded by, by that. But we also know that um, financial abuse can occur in situations where um, money appears not to be an issue. So there are significant um, things to keep paying attention to in relation to that in terms of job opportunities and how we think about that and how we move beyond siloing domestic and family violence or other experiences of victimisation and recognising how do we have a public conversation about women's security more broadly and the importance of this um, kind of study is that it's a partnership but also that it pays attention to a specific and important group and we need to keep having surveys and do this kind of research for different kinds of groups in our community because there are experiences that all women understand and know but there's also specificity and we need to have ambitious policy um, that is informed, that has an imagination that's informed by diversity but also understands that nuance so that we don't just have responses that are for all women and assume that that will enhance their security. I really, I don't have anything to add to that other than to say precarity and vulnerability go hand in hand for all people. And uh, the, the more that we can do in that space to ensure a more holistic security for women and to be thinking long term, not short term. I mean, the, the four years that was mentioned in the new national, in the latest national plan, it's short term thinking about the people that are in our country and in Australia now as, as though they, they won't be here in four years. And so it doesn't matter how we treat them. And, and I just feel we need a completely different lens when we look at that so that we're thinking about these as these people as future th as, as potentially future thought leaders, the international students who are experienced precarity at the moment. Um, and, and to just be bold in our vision and to be long term in our vision about the diverse and wonderful Australia that I think this that we can have. I have nothing to add. I think I've said enough. <laughs> well, I um, can never say enough. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, to, to Rebecca Wicks and Marie Seagrave and particularly to you, Nardole, for a really fascinating uh, discussion. Thank you.